welcome to the session that I'm going to be presenting on building an image similarity search using Spotify and I, PyTorch, and Azure Machine Learning. I'm going to be covering a number of different technologies in this session. Most of the code is pretty much basic uh, Python code, um, so you should be able to follow through. And I do have um, quite a lot of this video on a YouTube channel, um, so I will uh, refer you to uh, to that. I've got all of the theory on working with Spotify and I, so you can run through the code samples. And I will also be recording this stuff on getting the stuff to run in the cloud uh, with Azure uh, Machine Learning and those types of uh, technologies. A bit about myself, I, I describe myself as a developer, trainer, mentor, and evangelist. I love building stuff. So I used to say that I'm happiest working in Visual Studio. I think I'm happiest now working in ML Studio, doing lots of stuff with it with it, machine learning. I deliver a lot, a lot of training courses. So last week, I was teaching a Microsoft AI course on the AI technologies. I'm also recording a course for Plural Site on stream analytics, which we've seen in the previous session. I like to work as a mentor. So a couple of the, uh, one of the projects I'm working in now uh, is I'm helping a company to work with Azure Machine Learning to be able to solve uh, complex uh, vision uh, uh, scenarios. One of those is working with drone footage, um, looking at the drone logs so we can get the position of the drone, the camera angle of the drone, and be able to plot things on a map uh, that are coming from uh, the drone uh, footage, which is a really interesting uh, project to, uh, to be uh, working with. I also like to explore new and emerging technologies and to help companies to adapt and use those technologies. That's kind of this uh, evangelist um, side of me. So for a long time, I've been evangelizing Microsoft Azure. Uh, I kind of feel that my job is done with that. People get cloud, people have got stuff running in Microsoft Azure, and AI seems to be uh, the new thing, uh, especially on the Microsoft platform. AI is uh, new and it's gaining uh, gaining lots and lots of ground. So uh, definitely, I think Microsoft's a great company to be working with with these AI technologies, taking the lead in, in lots and lots of areas. I work for Active Solution, uh, who are helping to sponsor this uh, event, uh, which, uh, which we're all uh, grateful for. And uh, I'm also an AI MVP. I think we've got three of them uh, based in uh, Sweden. Um, Peter Anholm was meant to be here. Unfortunately, he's got a sore throat. So we nearly had uh, all of the, um, the AI MVPs based in Sweden in, in the same room. I also do a lot with the community. Uh, so I've been organizing the Cloud Burst Conference since 2011 and the AI Burst Conference. I've also been involved in the global boot camps, both the um, global Azure boot camp and the global AI boot camp. I travel around and speak at conferences and uh, I've got my YouTube channel there if you want to check out some of my, my videos. So Tess uh, has talked a lot about working with Vision AI. And Henrik's also mentioned uh, talking about image classification and how we can take, say, you know, images of cats and images of dogs, and we can classify those. So with image classification, it's the entire image that's a cat, the entire image that's a dog, and we're putting the labels on those images. Is it a cat or is it a dog? And then with object detection, you can get images like this, where there's a cat and a dog. And these algorithms are quite a bit more complex because as well as saying what the actual object is, it's also going to give us a bounding box and a probability around that of, uh, you know, where it thinks the uh, the object is located in the image. So we're able to do things like that, that object detection, which you've also seen, I think, in, in Tess's uh, presentation. Other things that we can do with Vision AI, we can do something called semantic segmentation. And what this is doing is it's doing a classification on the image at a pixel level. Now, with COVID, we've all become very familiar of this because everybody's using Teams and using Zoom. And they have um, algorithms that are able to take out the background on a live video feed. So that's uh, semantic segmentation. What it's doing is it's analyzing the video feed and it's saying what video is a person and what video is not a person. And it's generating like a bitmap mask and masking out the not person. So, you know, when you go in these meetings, there's always some amusing person who's got like a prison cell as a background or a beach as a background or they're in a bar or something. You can do things like that. And then uh, it's why, you know, when you pick up a glass and start drinking, uh, the algorithm gets really confused because it doesn't know what is a person and, and what is it, what is a background. We've also got regression which we can do on images. Normally, we think of regression on tabular data. You know, how much does an apartment cost? How much can this person loan? But you can also do it on vision data. This is from a website that Microsoft had running uh, a few years ago, where you could uh, take a photo and upload a photo, or you know, use your webcam to take a photo, and it would uh, have a guess at how old you are based on um, the actual uh, image. So we are doing object detection here. 
we're detecting this, that there is a face in the image. And then we're doing regression on that to be able to come up with a numerical uh, value uh, for those. What I'm going to be uh, talking about is image similarity. So if you've got an object um, that you would like on an online store, you say interested in this watch, I kind of like this watch. I would like watches that kind of look a bit like this watch, that share the same features as this, this watch and have some kind of similarity uh, in the image. So it's different from classification. But using the neural networks uh, that we've been working with, I'm going to be using PyTorch for shrink tests with showing her uh, examples with, with Keras and TensorFlow. But the principles are very uh, similar. We can use these uh, pre-trained networks to do this, or we can use custom uh, networks to do this. And it's literally about eight lines of Python uh, to be able to build an image similarity search. It's not that, uh, that uh, complex. And most of the code is kind of iterating through the images and so on. This, uh, I kind of got inspiration. I was going into work uh, to give a presentation on, on uh, vision projects. And this advert was in the underground. And I thought, well, this is cool. They've got a website where you can sell stuff. And that uh, box kind of um, reminded me of a bounding box. Wouldn't it be nice if you could um, take a photo of that earring? You could look at um, you know, different earrings that were sold on the web, find a similar earring, and, uh, and estimate the actual price for that earring. I was thinking that would be a nice um, scenario for uh, you know, selling uh, items at second hand and so on. So the algorithm that I'm going to be using uh, is uh, called Spotify Annoy. It was generated uh, by Spotify when they were looking at solving the problem of doing music recommendation. We typically think of a recommendation. Again, this is something that, that Tess has mentioned, a recommendations engine of saying, well, if I like Depeche Mode, and um, my friend likes Depeche Mode, and my friend also likes this other band, then will recommend this other band uh, to me because the same people like, uh, like the same music. However, you get a new band and new music that comes into Spotify. There are no recommendations on this piece of music. How do you know which uh, users are gonna be interested in listening to that music? So what Spotify was trying to do uh, was to go through their catalog of millions and millions of tracks and say, um, you know, we've got a new piece of music. What music is this music similar to? What does it sound like? So you can, from if you've played around with audio files uh, and done music production, there is something called a spectrogram. So it's basically a graph of um, normally a waveform is um, amplitude over time. Uh, a spectrogram is kind of like a pattern with frequency over time. And that's basically a bitmap image. And you can use regular neural networks to do uh, you know, classification and analysis of music. So this is what Spotify are doing. It's also possible to use the same algorithm uh, for working with uh, images as well, which is what I'm doing. I haven't made any changes to the algorithm. I'm just using that. And it's available on GitHub to, uh, to download. So if you want to download it, uh, there's uh, the actual uh, GitHub link. I'd recommend checking out this presentation. If you Google on YouTube for Spotify Annoy, uh, you'll get this, this presentation. This is by the author talking about how um, he, he was actually using it and how the algorithms developed. It also goes into a lot of depth about how the algorithm works and how scalable it is. Obviously, Spotify has millions and millions of tracks of music. Uh, we want to be able to find similar uh, tunes very, very quickly. So it's optimized for speed, being able to build uh, this similarity uh, search index. What we're seeing on the screen here is uh, finding similar plates of food. The original experiment, the original network, this was actually a regression problem where he was looking at different uh, recipes on the internet. And in the recipe, it also mentions the number of calories uh, that are in this. And what he was trying to do is um, take a photo of a plate of food, and it's going to tell you how many calories is, is in that plate of food. That's kind of a regression uh, problem. And he was saying that um, you know it wasn't too accurate at doing that. Uh, however, the network that he trained uh, was really good at being able to find out features uh, that were in plates of food. And that's uh, the network that he's used. I'll talk about featureization a bit later on. And what we can see in each row is the image on the left is the image that we are searching for. And then all of the other images are the results that are coming back. So you can see that um, it is able to kind of find stuff that looks similar uh, to the actual uh, target image. So this is really uh, what, uh, what I would like to be able to build. So. Um, Convolutional Networks 101, uh, a bit of an introduction to the theory. Uh, we usually start with something very, very simple, which is the handwritten digits, MNIST uh, data set. And what we're going to be doing is kind of um, you know, doing classification on those. Tess also mentioned about convolutions. And a convolution is basically this uh, matrix uh, that's going to kind of sweep the image. It does kind of uh, loads and loads of sweeps on the image. And you can see that when the 
convolution uh, matrix gets to that point, the pixels in the convolution network match uh, the pixels in the image, and it's able to give out um, you know a higher uh, higher reading. So that is basically acting as a, as a line detector. It's able to detect these vertical lines. In the early days of computer vision, these networks were built by hand. So somebody would actually um, you think about the uh, the values that they put into that matrix to do things like edge detection and um, you know uh, line detection, corner detection, and they would build those uh, together to be able to come up with um, you know features and shapes and uh, and various things like that. Everything was done by hand. Today uh, we use uh, GPUs and back propagation. It takes millions of calculations to figure this out, but this is what GPUs are really good at. So a simple convolutional network uh, will look something like this. We have our input, and then the various layers are going to be uh, extracting more and more detail about out from the convolutional network. So we can see that edge detection is, uh, is uh, takes place early on. We combine the edge detection to do shape detection, and further down, we can get to the feature detection. So that's really kind of showing only kind of uh, four layers there. Um, when we work with a library like ResNet, the simplest example, the one that I'm using and Tess was talking about this as well, is ResNet 18. I think was it Henrik was mentioning ResNet 18 as being being a quick uh, quick model to train. We've also got, I think it's ResNet 35, ResNet 50, ResNet 101, ResNet 152. And that's um, in relation to the number is how many of these convolution layers that are in that particular network. So the ResNet 18 has 18 uh, convolution networks. Another example from Tess uh, was this one about, you know, how do we distinguish between uh, a chihuahua and, and a cupcake? And this is relating to the features. If uh, the image has ears and eyes and noses and mouths, then it's going to be a dog, uh, a chihuahua. If it has blueberries and paper cups, then it is going to be a cupcake. In the world of this uh, neural network, there's only two objects. There's a chihuahua and a cupcake. Nothing, uh, nothing else exists. So when it's doing classification, it has to be one or the other. So looking at, uh, at uh, CNN, um, this is an interesting video um, from a project that Google did called Deep Dream. And uh, what Deep Dream is, is it's running through a neural network and it's kind of analyzing what the neural network sees. In the early layers of the network, we see that it's doing ed edge detection. And now it's starting to do shape uh, detection as we actually progress through uh, the layers of the neural network. And these images get more, uh, more and more complex as we, uh, we run through. So by the, oh, round about here, you can see that it starts to detect eyes because eyes are very important in the objects that were trained on this particular network. So detecting eyes is, is something that the network tends to be very good at. And if we go deeper into the network, we can see that more detailed uh, features start to appear. You can see that it's coming out with uh, things like uh, that start to look like dogs' heads. And then we get these kind of um, weird uh, animals appearing. And as we go deeper into the network, we get kind of a, a more a detailed features, the things that do look like dogs and, and foxes as, as we get further down here. This is kind of a bit like the um, image generation. It's kind of like um, you know image generation on acid. It's just creating all of these kind of weird hallucinations. You can see there's like a, a fish type thing there, and there's some kind of weird thing that looks a bit like an animal like with, with eyes stuck on it. And um, that's basically what's going on inside these uh, these neural networks. And it's very easy uh, to use a neural network for doing image classification. So this is, um, I'll just walk you through the code here. This is in Python. Uh, we're importing uh, Torch, uh, which is the PyTorch library, and then the Torch Vision. I'm also importing uh, the Anoy from uh, in Anoy Index. I'm not, I'm not actually using it in this uh, in this particular example. I think I can uh, just just comment comment that. Incidentally, Anoy is an acronym. It stands for Approximate Nearest Neighbor. Oh yeah. And approximate nearest neighbor is the algorithm uh, that we are uh, kind of uh, trying to analyze. I'll talk a bit about that when we get a bit more into the theory. So what this is doing is it's creating, uh, no, that's not the one, sorry. I do need that line of coding for that demo to work, but the demo I was wanting to show was this one that was the actual uh, theory. So I'm bringing in Torch Vision, and uh, what I'm doing is going to a folder on my machine that contains loads of images of dogs. And this is the code that's actually going to uh, generate the neural network. I'm setting the weights to the neural network as a ResNet 18 default weights. 
So this is a pre-trained network that is already going to, going to start, start being able to do classification. So all of the weights are available for us. I'm then generating a new ResNet 18 model and specifying uh, that use those weights as the actual uh, weights of the model, and then setting the model to the evaluation stage. And then I'm actually printing out the model on the screen so we can actually see uh, what that looks like. We need to take the JPEG files that are coming in and transform them to 224 by 224 by 3 um, images. So this is what this transform is doing. It's going to take whatever size the inbound image is, squash it into a square, 224 by 224 um, pixels, and then convert it to a torch uh, tensor. So then I'm listing all of the images in the folder, and I'm running through all of those images. I'm loading up the image into memory. That's what this code is doing. I'm using the PIL library to do that. If it is not RG, if the color mode is RGB, I am converting it to RGB so we can get three channels and then applying the transform to the image. And then just doing a check here to see if the um, transform contains three channels. If it's a black and white image, then I'm going to skip it uh, because that's only got one channel. It won't work in the network. We could process it and convert it into an RGB one if, if we wanted to. This is going to do the inference in the network. So we pass the input into the network and we get out the result. And then here I'm just getting out the class ID and the score and the category name and then some code to actually draw it on the image. So most of this is just housekeeping. The actual code to do the image classification is very, very simple. So if I run this, we'll see the details of the network coming out here and we'll see the images coming. This says Scottish Deerhound, Cheesebeck Bay at Retriever. And then we've got Walker Hound. And what it's doing is uh, it's doing the classification on these these dogs. I think I'll try and zoom in on a few of these so you can actually see uh, the names that are, that are coming up here. So that one's being classified as a whippet. And so the interesting thing here is it's not just saying this is a dog. It's saying what the actual breed of dog is rather than saying that it, it is a dog. And what that means is that the network weights are trained at being able to distinguish between different dog breeds. So if I wanted to build a neural network that could identify the features of dogs, this is a good one to use uh, because there's so many different dog breeds. It must be very good at uh, understanding um, you know, the differences between these types of dogs. So it will understand a lot about the features that are relevant to dogs. I'm going to try and stop this, which is a challenge to do because it's going to keep flashing up more, uh, more images. And I can close all of these um, windows. It's not as good with cats. So one of the things that we need to have is a model that has the appropriate features related to what we would like to classify. For example, if I go into the cats folder, and I'm actually using a, a data set, which is the, um, it's available on Kaggle, it's called cats versus dogs. That's classified as a red fox. And then we've got a tiger cat, an Egyptian cat. That's an Egyptian cat. That's a window screen. No, no idea what that is. And then we've got Egyptian cat, Persian cat, and that's a quilt. So it's not as good at being able to uh, understand cats as it is at understanding dogs. Also, there's not that many different types of cats. It's saying, you know, it's a, it's a Persian cat or it's a tiger cat or it's, a, it's an Egyptian cat. There's not that many classes of cats, whereas there's loads and loads of classes of dogs. So if you train this model uh, to be able to find similar cats, it's not as good at finding similar cats as it is in finding uh, finding similar dogs. So uh, if I drop back to the, um, the slides, we're going to a bit more theory about how the um, image similarity uh, is going to work. So this is what the networks look like when we're doing the feature um, extraction. At the end of the network, we have this classification phase, which is when we think of a neural network, this is typically uh, one of the layers that we think about, these linear layers, where the number of outputs is going to be equal to the number of classes uh, that we would like to be able to uh, categorize. And these weights are going to be the features. So we feed in all of the features, and these neurons are going to say, well, is it a cat or is it a dog, based on what the actual features are present in this image. So in order to extract the features, we just do this. We delete the classification layer. Or in PyTorch, we replace that layer with something called an identity layer, which means that instead of getting um, you know, the um, classification values coming out of the network, what I will get is the actual feature values. 
and in ResNet 18, there are 512 of them. I think if we go up to ResNet 34 or ResNet 50 or ResNet 101, then there's going to be 2,048 of these things here. So when we're looking at doing the nearest neighbor search, what we want to do is to find the nearest neighbor uh, where all of these values are the closest. And there's many different algorithms to be able to do that. So if you're Spotify and you've got millions and millions of uh, audio files, this is a really hard thing to do. Well, it's actually an easy thing to do uh, that, that would take a, take a long, long time. But it's a hard thing to do really, really quickly. Now, in 1D space, it's dead easy. Uh, we know we've got a line and the nearest neighbor is going to be the closest point on that particular line. If you go into 2D space, uh, you know, it's really easy to see, you know, which point is nearest which other point. In 3D space, that gets easier. But we're now in 512 dimensional space. There's going to be 512 of these. So this is a hard, hard problem to solve. And this is what Spotify Inoi is able to do really, really quickly. So what we can do with Spotify Inoi is to be able to create uh, an index. Now, we've got our pre-trained network. And we've got our data set. And in one of the examples I'm going to be looking at is finding similar uh, watches. So the images data set is going to be just a, a library full of photos. We don't need to label that data. We don't need to say this is a watch or this is a cat or this is a dog. We just need as many photos as we can get. So what we do is we take our neural network that's going to be outputting these particular features and we run each of these images through that neural network. We get the feature values. Uh, there's 512 of them. And then we feed them into the annoy algorithm. And we basically add on um, the array of features and then we add on the um, uh, an integer, uh, which is going to be the index of that particular item. Once we've done that, we can actually build the index. And uh, it basically works with a tree-like structure. So there's going to be like a, a load, load of decision trees in there. The webcast on, on YouTube, uh, where the author explains it, talks about how all of this stuff works. And we can choose how many trees that we create when we generate that image. The more trees that we create, the more accurate it will be. Uh, however, it will be larger in memory. And if you've got several million um, uh, inputs that you put into it they, these things can get can get fairly big so i spec usually specify 10 which is which is a fairly default value and that will basically save out an index file so that's the process of the index uh, creation it takes when i'm running it in machine learning i think it took about 11 minutes to do i think that was about 12,000 images so it's about a thousand images a minute when i was running it in azure ml and most of that is reading the images from uh, from blob storage so it doesn't take that long as a batch process to run through even millions of these uh, these images. So once the image is created, we can actually use the annoy index. So the idea here with the watches is you can take a photo of your watch and you can basically search for watches that look like your watch. So what you need to do is to take the annoy index file, you need to load that into annoy, and then you need to send your watch through the same neural network as was used to build the index. That's going to get out the features. And you just tell the annoy algorithm to find the indexes of all of the images that are closest to that particular input image. And you're going to get an output that's uh, something like that, where you've got these, uh, these similar uh, watches are coming out. Okay, so how do we build one of these and uh, how do we actually uh, create this? So if I drop back into uh, Visual Studio and I'm going to go to this um, CNN uh, create index and I'm going to set this thing as the uh, startup file and we can walk through the, the code here. <clears throat> now this is very similar to the previous code in that I'm creating my neural network. However, what I'm doing is I'm actually uh, replacing the fully connected layer at the end of the network with a, an identity layer. So if I comment out this line of code and uh, stick a breakpoint on here and then run this, and uh, drop back to the... Um, command prompt and just increase this in size. We can actually see the structure of the network there. So this is the ResNet. We can see all, all of these different layers that we've got, layer two, layer three, and uh, as we uh, we uh, run down. So we've got all of these different uh, blocks. As you go up from ResNet 18 to the other uh, ResNet, so you get more and more of these, um, uh, these actual uh, layers. And the convolutional layers, uh, the kernel size is basically how big the actual network is. A lot of these are using three by three. 
uh, which basically means in my example, it was five by five. That's how big the matrix is. The stride is how many pixels they move uh, at each time. And then the padding is uh, just, you know, areas that it puts around uh, to keep uh, and preserve the image uh, re resolution there. So those are all of the convolutional layers. Now, because this is a classification one, this is the actual final uh, linear layer uh, where we've got the features that are coming in being 512 and the out features being 1,000. So this image classification can have up to 1,000 classes if we would, if we would uh, like, it, like it to do that. That's the final uh, linear layer. So this is, has the name of FC, uh, the last fully connected layer. So the code that I'm doing is replacing the FC layer with an identity layer. So what that will mean is it's just going to output the features. So that's one line of uh, code that I need to do there. Now, if we run it, we should be able to see that the network looks different. So if I drop back here and we zoom in, you can see that the FC layer is just an identity layer. And that means it's just going to return uh, the actual uh, values uh, there. So what we can do is probably step a, a bit through the code. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is to create uh, the annoy index. So I'm just calling the constructor there. Now, this is going to be the number of uh, floating point values that we use within the index when we're doing our telemetry detection or the number of, of dimensions. So we need to know that that is going to be 512. And we saw uh, from the uh, when I was printing out the model that there's going to be 512 features there. Uh, we've seen that on the screen. So that's how I know that, that value. If I was using a more complex network, then I would have 2048 of these things. It would be 2048 dimensional space. When we're doing nearest neighbor, there is various different uh, options that we can use uh, to actually have the algorithm working. I've not experimented with these, but Angular means that within the 512 dimensional space is going to be using the angle uh, that we are going. It's very often called um, looking at a, a cosine method of being able to work with um, identifying the nearest feature. And the idea here uh, is that um, it's not going to be the closest in that space, but the closest angle of the vector uh, in, in that space uh, that, that's going to be used to, to determine that. So that's in some cases, that can be more accurate. And there's various different uh, options uh, that we can, we can use for that. The next thing we do is iterate through all of the JPEGs. Uh, we open up the image. I'm doing my RGB check. I'm doing the actual uh, transform on here. And then I'm running it through uh, the network to get out the result. However, this is going to be the feature set that's coming out, these 512 features. I'll just stick the breakpoint on there so we can see what that thing, uh, thing looks like. OK, and probably run to the next breakpoint. If I just stick a uh, result in the immediate window, that's not right. You can see that the torch dot size is 512 by one. Uh, and these are the 512 floating point values uh, that make up uh, the actual uh, features. So what we then do is uh, add this to the Spotify index. And we specify the actual index ID. Now, the index, when we do a search, it's going to return a bunch of integers, which are the actual IDs uh, related to the um, objects that it thinks are the nearest. So we need some kind of lookup to be able to say, well, you know, uh, ID 234 is this particular ID here. So what I'm also doing is building up uh, an actual array of uh, these things. I think I define the array up here somewhere called image names. And what I'm doing is basically adding on to image names uh, the actual name of the JPEG file. So we're going to get a text file with all of the images in, and we're going to get um, the uh, the Spotify index uh, being, uh, being uh, built up. Then what we do is I'm actually breaking out at, uh, I'll break out at 2000 actually. Um, so what that's going to do is to run through 2000 of these images and then it will break out of that loop. What we can then do is save out uh, the actual index and then save out the text file. And um, that, that's going to give us the index that we can work with. Before we save it, we need to build the index. So this build process is specifying build the index with 10 trees. I can specify different values for that. And then it's going to save out those particular files. So what I'm going to do is to just to run this without debugging. So if I make sure it's been saved, I can right click and do, I think, start without debugging. Hopefully nothing is going to go wrong, and it's going to go through those uh, docs files and generate those. Let's just see how long it takes per 100, because I don't want it to take too long. That's going to take too long, actually. So what I'll do is I'll change it to 1,000 instead of instead of 2,000. 
I'm trying to think how long I'm going to talk about the um, the next section, which is how we actually use that particular index once it's been generated. So let's start with our debugging, and then we can look at how the actual search process works. So the search process, what that is going to do is to actually load up the um, index and then also load up the um, the text file. So what I'm doing here is creating a new uh, an index file. This has to match 512 and Angular. And then I'm doing uh, index.load, and that's loading the previously uh, created one. Then what I'm doing is just generating a grid of images, because I want to actually um, save out so we can visually compare and see if it is coming up with um, these similar uh, images. And this is just basically going to go through the same set. It's going to load up the image, uh, and then I'm going to do the actual um, the actual search. So what we do is we load the image into memory. Uh, the, we then actually do the transformation, and then I get the uh, feature set out from the model. So the same thing, I'm getting the results out by uh, putting the um, transform through the model. And then here on the uh, nearest neighbor index, I'm calling annoy index got get, get nearest neighbors by vector, passing in the result that comes out from the neural network and saying, I want the 24 nearest matches. And that's the line of code that we call. Then most of this is just like housekeeping. What I'm doing is just, uh, well, running through all of those actual images. Actually, that should be... Um, 24 there, not 99, because I was using uh, 24 images there. And we're basically going to be plotting those images onto the um, uh, on, on, onto the actual big tile image. So we'll see the original image and we'll see all of the, uh, the nearest images. And then it's just going to save this out to this image uh, dump uh, folder. Okay, so how are we doing with... Uh, with yep, yeah, it's created, uh, created that index uh, for us. So I should hopefully be able to set this one as the startup file. And I'm also going to go to the uh, outbound file. So if I open the files in, in Explorer and go to the images dump, you can see that that folder is empty. And when I run it, hopefully, uh, we're going to get um, images uh, created in, the, in that particular folder. So if I drop back here and run this, So you can see it's doing the searching and the plotting. It's doing it fairly quickly here. And if I go back here into image dump, just wait for it to, uh, I think it's doing about 50 of those. I can probably bring up uh, bring up this one and, uh, okay. I'll just close these instances of photo and then just see if we can bring up this image here. So this one here that's top left, this is the input image. And then the other 24 images are the nearest neighbors. So obviously, the nearest neighbor to the input image is going to be the actual image itself. It's able to identify that. But then the other dogs that you can see do look quite similar to this particular dog here. And these are ordered in order. So we're going along here, and then along here, and then along here. So hopefully, um, it is going to be pretty good at being able to recognize similar uh, dogs here. Now, I haven't been through all 12,000 of these images. This is just on a, based on 1,000 images. So out of the 1,000 images, this was the input image. But it is finding you know, dogs that do look fairly similar to that uh, particular uh, dog there. I do have a website with this I'll show later on, uh, which is indexed on the full 12,000 when we've got that process running within, uh, within that Microsoft Azure. So this is OK. Um, what I've done here is I've kind of had my data science hat on. And says, well, we're looking at the theory of this. I'm running stuff on my laptop. And what I'm doing is I'm saving the model down to my laptop or this search index down to my laptop. I've then uh, got uh, another Python console application. And that Python console application is going to you know, go through all of these images. And you can see I've got a proof of concept of this thing working. However, we can't really sell this to a customer. We can't really um, you know, use this. We can't really develop on this as a team. What I'd like to do is have a process uh, where I can put some what we call MLOps um, onto this. MLOps is to data scientists what DevOps is to developers. So it's a way of being able to um, you know, have a common workspace where we can work. We can manage our data sets. We can manage our experiments. Also, when we create the indexes, we can register them in our machine learning workspace. And then I would like to be able to publish this as an API. So instead of having to run a Python console application, we can expose an API with an API key, and somebody can build a website that consumes that API, and they're able to do the similar image search. Now we've got a product uh, that we can actually implement in our 
company's uh, website so that people can actually search for similar images. So as on machine learning uh, is a way of being able to put all of that process around the actual um, management of all of these um, all of these artifacts and it, it really runs through um, it basically provides a platform uh, for data scientists to be able to develop stuff on and uh, work as a team so within machine learning studio um, we've got the concept of working with Jupyter notebooks so you can create Jupyter notebooks you can run Jupyter notebooks you've got an actual uh, environment that you can run in before I go any further I'm just going to start up my uh, compute instance so if I go to um, this console here i'm going to go to compute and i'm just going to start this compute instance here so it's ready uh, for when ah oh, that thing's given up uh because yeah when i was checking for the um the actual size of the inputs you can see that this is a, a monochrome image it only has one channel where it should have three channels so it's given up on that particular image but we, we ran through enough to be able to um to actually uh, diagnose uh, that. So I'm just gonna check that my instance is starting. Yeah, uh, so that should be fine uh, when I want to run uh, the, the demo. Okay, so notebooks, this allows us to work with Jupyter Notebooks if we like uh, that as an actual programming environment. We don't have to do that. We can work with it uh, in uh, different uh, different technologies as well. We can just run, run Python files. We can also work remotely if we like to work in Visual Studio Code. You can download the notebooks into Visual Studio Code and upload them back into ML at Studio. It provides file storage and we can use Git. So all of these notebooks that we're developing, we can check them into source control. We can share them with other uh, developers. We've also got the automated ML, uh, which Hank was talking about. Uh, I can actually do auto ML on images for image classification. I can do semantic segmentation. I can do object uh, detection. There isn't anything for uh, regression from images uh, as yet uh, that I've seen, but maybe that's coming in the future. We can also do text classification as uh, a, um, using using auto ml we're looking at that uh working with an auction site so people are um, uploading images of things and what we want to be able to do is to classify the auction lots and at the moment we're doing image classification which is fine that works well until somebody wants to sell a painting of a bottle of wine which it then classifies as a bottle of wine another problem we have is if uh, if somebody's selling a toy car sometimes it classifies that as a real car so by using the text classification, we can take the description of the item and be able to use that to um, help as well as the image. So we've got kind of two sources uh, that can give us a more accurate uh, reading. AutoML can also work on tabular data. That's what was available first. So we can upload tabular data and it will literally do probably about two months work uh, of, of uh, data science in probably about half an hour or, or an hour when it basically runs the, um, the tabular data, testing all of these different algorithms, finding the best algorithms and then tuning the best algorithms to give us uh, the best results. These things are known as experiments. I really like this because uh, it kind of brings in the science thing. And the reason I was asking Tess that question about, um, you know, how long does it take? What's the budget on uh, on this? Is when you do a machine learning project, uh, there could be uh, no actual uh, outcome of it. Uh, it's not like somebody says build a website and you go away uh, for two months and the customer says where's the website and says oh. We couldn't build the website, it didn't work. And just, um, you can do that in data science. Somebody tells you to solve a particular problem, you can spend two months working on it and go, no, we can't do that. And that's why Tess was saying, you know, doing a feasibility study at the beginning uh, is something that's really important to kind of get an idea of, uh, is this project gonna be feasible? I'll mention a bit more about that later on when I talk about running a, running a proof of concept. We've got the concept of pipelines. So the machine learning experiment uh, can be built as a pipeline. The pipeline can be executed as a, um, as a process from an API. So Spotify, the, their music collection is not gonna be static. I don't know if they do it every day or if they do it every week or if they do it every month, but they will have to regenerate that index. So automating uh, the regeneration of that index using a pipeline and just say, you know, every day at midnight, create a new index and, and run that as an automated uh, process. We can build components that can slot into those pipelines by writing a Python script and making that available. So if we need to, obviously, um, as RML doesn't do Spotify, but I could build a Spotify annoy component that would actually run and build that. And then that could be a part of, part of a pipeline. There is a, an SDK uh, written in Python, which I would recommend using 
there is also a .NET SDK, which I have not included on the slides. I wouldn't recommend uh, going there. If you look at the SDK samples, I think about um, something like 0.3% of the samples are written on the .NET SDK, and those are the SDK samples. I'm not sure if it's as fully featured as the, uh, the Python SDK, but if you're using Azure Machine Learning, you pretty much need to be working with Python, unless you're just doing something fairly basic with the AutoML capabilities. It is really uh, built on uh, Python. We've also got uh, the concept of working with data. That's going to be important for us. A data store is some kind of cloud-based storage system within uh, Microsoft Azure. And these are very versatile. I've kind of th shown three options on the slide deck, blob storage, SQL database, and Azure Data Lake. However, you can use many different uh, options. So if you're working with images, you'll bang all of those images into, into blob storage. Tabular data, well, that's going to be a CSV file in blob storage. Or it could be a table in a SQL Server database. The data set is really a pointer to whereabouts that data is. So I upload you know, 15,000 images of dogs into blob storage. I then create a dogs data set that just basically points and says the dogs are here and points to where they are in that particular storage mechanism. So in here, a data set, it's actually been renamed to a data asset. So these are now data assets, I think. So two S's in asset. Yeah, so we kind of uh, think about these things as being data assets rather than data sets. I'm not sure what, why they made that change. But uh, that isn't, uh, doesn't contain the actual data. It just points to where the data is within the data store. Environments. These are going to be, um, when it's running compute, it's going to be using Docker uh, containers to create the compute instances. So when we create an environment, we don't actually create um, a, a running Docker container, but we have the specification for what the Docker container is going to be. There are pre-made uh, environments for us. So if I want to do image classification with PyTorch, there will be a PyTorch environment available for it. There's a SkyKit Learn environment available if we're going to be using SkyKit Learn. There are no environments available supporting Spotify Annoy, but I can create an environment by having a YAML file that describes what type of environment I will need to run Spotify Annoy. So you can create and manage and customize these environments as you see, as you see fit. We've then got the compute. And these are two different types. We've got compute instances, and it's a compute instance I just uh, started up uh, in my uh, machine learning uh, studio. These are used to run the notebooks. One disadvantage of Azure ML, uh, which you're going to find, uh, if you've been using uh, something like a Google Colab, you don't pay for the actual compute in Google Colab. You just go in there, and it's free. You've got your compute instance, which uh, spins up and uh, deprovisions. And then you've got a certain amount of hours of GPU uh, that you can use in Google Colab. So it kind of gives the impression that it's free uh, to run those actual uh, notebooks, which is in Google Colab. However, over here, when you want to run code in a notebook, you need to have your compute instance running, and you're going to be paying you know, so many cents per hour uh, to actually have that compute instance uh, running. You can configure these things to shut down when you've stopped using them. So there is scheduled shutdown, and you can have on idle shutdown. So you're not going to be paying if you uh, go home over the weekend and leave that thing running. Uh, you, it's not going to just stay running 24-7. It's, it's, it's going to shut down after a while. So those are used, used for the notebooks. I usually use quite low power ones when I'm running in my own as our subscription. So it doesn't, it doesn't cost too much. Then we've got the compute clusters. The experiments, ideally, uh, should run on the compute clusters. And this allows us to uh, provision uh, a number of resources uh, that we can use uh, for, uh, for the experiment execution. You could have a, a cluster just having one instance. So when I run uh, an experiment, it just provisions one instance. Uh, the experiment runs on that instance, and then the instance is deprovisioned once the experiment is run. So it manages the creation and the removal of all of those instances. If you're experimenting and you say, well, are we going to use ResNet 18 or ResNet 34 or ResNet 50? Um, you know, why not train on all of them at once? So you could configure your cluster to um, scale out to 10 instances. And then you can just run, a, run a, a code which goes through a loop and says, OK, run this data set with um, you know, eight different neural networks. And it will provision eight, eight cluster instances, run eight experiments concurrently, and then uh, shut down the instances what they are, then they are complete. It will still cost you the same. 
because you're going to pay for 50 hours of compute to run those eight experiments. So you may as well run them all, all in parallel and get the results back in two hours rather than 16 hours. Makes sense to um, leverage the parallel uh, processing that we've got there. Once you have done an experiment, you're going to get a model. Now, model, when I'm working with Spotify Annoy, there's kind of um, the model which is the um, ResNet 18 that's being used to actually um, you know, analyze the images and generate the features. And then there is what I'm calling the index, which is the uh, Spotify Annoy file that I use to use the search. So a model is just basically a collection of files that we're gonna use in uh, an API to be able to analyze the particular image. So in my case, um, the model is um, actually actually created uh, from the weights, uh, but here, uh, my actual Annoy index and the CSV file uh, that contains all of, the, all of the image names, that is my model uh, that I'm gonna be uh, deploying. And then we've got the endpoints. We want something useful that can be called from a website. We want a REST-based API. Uh, where somebody can make a call to that API and we can get back the response uh, from, from that API. So what we want to do is to take that process that was running in Python console applications and move it to the cloud and be able to run it in Azure ML. So hopefully my compute instance is up and running. Yep, so it's saying that that uh, instance is running. And what I should be able to do is to just basically walk through uh, how I've got Spotify and I running in, in Azure. The first thing, is the data. So I've got some data stores present. And when you spin this, um, spin up a, a machine learning workspace, you get some uh, default data stores that are created. So you've got this workspace blob store, uh, which is the default one. I usually create another data store, which I've named data sets. And this uh, contains um, all of the actual data sets I'm working. So in the CSV section, you can see I've got apartment price data. And this is, um, I was doing some demos on the course I was teaching last week about doing auto ML for apartment price prediction on apartments uh, near to where I live. Also, looking at text classification. So I've got the IMDB movie classification training data here, which what this is doing is it's taking the description of a film and it's also giving you the class of the film. So this is the description from a drama film, uh, then we've got the documentary films, drama film, and and so on, reality TV and horror and various things like that. So the idea here is that we can train um, the text classification just as we can train image classification. And that was for the auction house, uh, looking at you know how this works, how long it takes to train, and would this be an effective mechanism uh, for being able to assist the image classification uh, for that uh, that auction house? We can also work with image data. So if I go into images uh, within pet images. Uh, you can see that we've got the dogs and this is uh, all of the actual dog data that's present in that data store so what that's is doing is it's just really browsing onto a blob storage account and showing me what's present in the in that storage account then we've got the data sets or the i keep calling them data sets they're data assets um so i've got one which is the um imb genre classification i've got ones for on the birds data set i think there's an apartment price one i don't know if i've created it maybe i haven't and then we've got the actual dogs uh, data set. So this is just pointing uh, to images slash pet images slash dog in the actual data sets data store. And we can explore this. And it's showing us uh, just basically all of, the, all of the actual files. So it's just a pointer that the experiment can use to access the data from the uh, data, uh, data store. Okay, um, the next thing that we need to do is we need to uh, actually run the job that is going to create the Spotify Annoy uh, Index. So I'm just kind of thinking if I've got time to do this because it may take a while for the Compute Index to, to actually uh, spin up. So this is the notebook that's actually going to run that particular job. And what we're doing, or run the actual experiment, what I'm doing is connecting to my uh, Azure Machine Learning Workspace. And then uh, I'm defining um, the actual compute target, which is going to be uh, this one here, uh, where the actual job is going to run. The experiment name is going to be Spotify Annoy, and the display name will be Dogs Similarity. And then I'm using datetime.now just to give a timestamp on that particular uh, experiment. It's going to create an index called Similarity Dogs, and it's going to uh, save that into the output path. So what we do is we create the job. We tell it to run the particular job and we tell it where the actual source code for the job is. So it's in the annoy index job source. It also needs an environment. So the environment that it's gonna be running on is gonna use dependencies.yaml, 
which is this file here, which is specifying that we need PyTorch, we need Torch Vision, we need Pillow, and we need Annoy. So that's going to make sure that Spotify and Annoy is uh, installed in that particular environment when uh, when we actually run the experiment. So um, the job itself, this is um, what's going to be running. So what I've done is I've copy pasted my code from uh, Visual Studio into uh, this Python file here. I've actually added parameters on so we can specify where the images are located. We specify the output path and the index name. So these are just uh, processing those, those various parameters, but it's pretty much the same code. Loop through, uh, load that, and then save the model out into the, onto the actual uh, file system. So what I should be able to do is to run this. So if I run uh, this cell up here, that will do the authentication with Azure ML, and hopefully that's going to work. It takes a while, usually, when you run the first cell uh, just to get the environment up and running. Uh, but then once that's done, then um, it's usually a lot quicker to run it a, a second time. Yeah, so you can see that that took six seconds to run and, and a while to actually spin up. However, when I run it again, you can see it runs in less than a second. Uh, here, this is actually going to create the job and uh, run the actual experiment. So if I run this cell, hopefully that's going to be successful. And uh, you can see it's now submitting the job to Azure Machine Learning, and the job has been uh, submitted. So that went fine. And then we should be able to see uh, it in the actual jobs. Um, this is, uh, if I go into all experiments, you can see that we've got Spotify and I. And these are the actual runs. You can see that I ran it um, yesterday just to make sure that my demo was working and it took 15 minutes to run. It is now in the queued state. Now, what it's waiting for is the compute cluster to spin up. So if I drop into the uh, compute clusters, we can see that this standard DS11 v2 low cluster is resizing from zero to one nodes. All of these other ones uh, are currently running on zero nodes, so they're not costing me anything. So when we create these compute clusters, we've got the choice of um, you know how we create them. So I don't need a GPU on this one. So I'm running on uh, this standard DS11 v2, which costs 19 cents an hour if it's dedicated. However, we've got the option of going to low priority, where it costs five cents an hour, uh, so four cents an hour for this, rather than 19 cents an hour. So we get roughly, and this varies a bit, it can be the an 80% cost saving going on to low priority. So what does low priority mean? It basically means that if the resources are available within the Azure region, then it will provision a machine for you and run your experiment. If resources are not available in the Azure um, region, then your experiment just sits in the queue. And then when the resources become available, it will provision a machine and run it for you. So I'm kind of, I don't know, lucky, but I've never, I've only think once or twice seen it when I've submitted an experiment and it's not actually provisioned the uh, the machine directly. Um, not much, uh, and when that has happened, usually wait, wait half an hour or an hour or something, and then you'll get your instance. So maybe if uh, a region is really, really busy, it may be, say, two o'clock in the morning when you get your ins instance available, if you're really, really unlucky. But generally, these things do start up pretty Pretty, uh, pretty quickly. And if it doesn't, you can just cancel the experiment and run it on a dedicated one. Definitely recommend those, especially if you're using doing GPU stuff, because this is when it starts to get expensive. Um, if I'm on dedicated, um, then it's you can see the actual prices. It's like dollars per hour uh, for these, uh, these actual machines. Whereas if you go on to the um, low priority, you can see that 23 cents an hour for a K80, you know, 76 cents an hour for a V100. So it's not expensive to run on these uh, these um, uh, GPU machines. When I was um, doing a proof of concept at the, the auction house, uh, we pretty much spun one of these thing, things up on Monday morning and uh, took it down on, on Friday afternoon. And it was running uh, pretty much the whole week. Uh, we were use, using that. And it's very, very inexpensive. It's actually costing us more to run the virtual machine that we're running the um, Jupyter Notebooks on than it is the actual GPU uh, that we're using, using the training on. And it's very convenient because these things will just provision and shut down uh, when we need them to uh, provision and, and shut down. So what should hopefully be happening if I go back to the um, compute instances? 
is this thing is still resizing. It will take it a few minutes to resize, and then it will actually start running running the job. Now, if I go back to the jobs, uh, we can see the one that I ran previously. So on Spotify Annoy, if I go to this dog similarity here that I ran yesterday, we can go to the um, outputs and logs. And this is just the, um, you know, when I do print in Python, the, uh, the stuff comes up here. So it's building the index, it's saved it. I can go into the outputs and in the model folder, you can see that we've got the, uh, the annoy file and we've got the text file and you can look what the, uh, the actual uh, text file looks like. So this is gonna be my uh, model. And what we do to register that model is we go into models and uh, I would like to register a model from a job output. So I can select, I think it's gonna be the one I ran uh, yesterday, this one here. Oh, I clicked on it, it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be that one. And then I click on next. And uh, the job output is gonna be in the output file. It's gonna be that model folder there, those two files. I click on next, give a name for that model, give a version for that one. And I click on next, click on register. And that model has now been registered within uh, Azure ML. But that doesn't give us the endpoint. How can we make this thing callable from uh, an external uh, website? We really need to have an API uh, that is going to be uh, callable. So what we can do is in the endpoint section, we can create these endpoints that allow us uh, to be able to do these types of, uh, to be able to host the model and host it uh, so it can actually be called. So if I go to uh, Annoy Dogs, uh, this is an actual endpoint. I can go to test this endpoint. And what I'm going to be uh, specifying is an image URL. Actually, I think um, I've got this thing here, which I can use, which is a photo of my watch. If I copy this and go back to the endpoints, and then the watch is annoy. And then we can go test, and I can drop in that URL there. And we can click on test. You can see the result coming back. These are the IDs of watches that look similar to my watches in the watches uh, database. So the way that we create these, uh, we need um, like three things. We need to have the compute resource. We need to have a definition of the environment and we need to have something called a scoring script, which is the Python that is gonna power the, uh, the API. So in environments, I've created an uh, annoy API environment. If we go into the context, I'm really rubbish at creating these XAML files. So this isn't as optimal as it should be. You can see I'm telling it it needs pandas, but I'm also telling it it needs pandas up here as well. But the important thing is that we've got Torch, we've got Torch Vision, and we've got Annoy present and installed there. And what the, that environment is then used when it's creating uh, the Docker container instance that is gonna power my particular endpoint. The scoring script is here. And this took me a while to get right. It's really hard to get these things working because um, you uh, you build it, you deploy it, and then it takes about can take anywhere between 20 minutes and half an hour, maybe 15 minutes if you're lucky, to provision the endpoint, and something goes wrong. So you fix it, you redeploy it, wait 20 minutes, and something else goes wrong. Now, I found it quite challenging to do that, but I have managed to get this thing working. So this is a Python Flask API. There is an initialization method. So here. That's just copy pasted from the code that I've written. We load the model, replace the identity layer, turn it into the eval node, create our transform, load the index and the index file. However, we're gonna be provided the model from the actual environment. So from the environment, we get the model directory where the model is uh, located. And then uh, we're actually going to uh, load up all of the actual um, image uh, names. So we've got all of that stuff in memory and then the initialization is complete. So that happens once the um, instance starts running. When it runs the Docker container, it runs through the initialization code and then the API is ready to use. When we call the API, we're gonna uh, get an image URL. So we need to download that URL and then we need to transform it, put it through the model, get the nearest neighbors, iterate through the nearest neighbors and then just return the image names for those various nearest neighbors. So that's it, there's not too much in the actual uh, API code. And then what can we build on top of that? So if I go to the um, website here, I'm not a web developer by trade, so uh, my websites are usually pretty rubbish. Um, they're usually fairly functional, but uh, they're not really written too well, as you can tell. I don't know how when it's not showing the image that it doesn't actually have this link here. I need to do something with visibility probably. But if I search, 
for this uh, Fitbit watch. You can see that this is the image I'm searching for, uh, which is a photo of a Fitbit on somebody's uh, wrist. And these are all of the, the watches in our catalog that kind of look like that one. The reason I've chosen watches, I think there's 2,500 in this, is when I got the data set off Kaggle, it also had the price and the brand of the watch. So here, uh, you can actually see these on tooltips. I wish I was clever enough to make it actually print the um, the price and the text as well in a nice table format. But I couldn't figure out how to do that. But they're coming up as, as tooltips. So we can go to a different watch here. And it's, it's displaying these type of watches. You can browse around them as well and say, well, I like that one. Find some that look more similar to that one or that one. And then you can get into old school digital watches and. Uh, find stuff like this. So I don't know if there's any of these really kind of old school Casio digital watches that you can find. Yeah, something like that. You can see that all of these uh, do have some kind of similarity uh, with the one that we are searching for. Um, so if I go in and take this copy, I did want to have it running on a webcam so you can actually take the photo and it will actually um, search from a webcam photo. But um, there you can see from that one, it's picking up images that do uh, do look like that uh, watch there. And then on dogs, this is uh, how it works with a full 12,000 uh, dogs. So when I search for German Shepherd, you can see that it's finding dogs that look like that one there. We can go to a Jack Russell. And uh, hopefully it's not breaking. Strange. More Labradors. And then if you search for the ugly dog, it's finding ones that, that look kind of like that. And you can browse around and say, well, you know, I like that dog. And then it finds more dogs, uh, dogs like that. And this dog here finds dogs that look like that. This is a lot more intu uh, le less intrusive than doing face recognition. Um, as I mentioned, you could use a face API here. Uh, people kind of get upset about doing finding similar faces and face detection, but everybody loves dogs. So, um, you know, it's fine to be able to look at uh, face detection with dogs and find out, find similar, uh, similar looking at looking at dogs. So uh, that's my session. Um, we don't really have time to kind of show how. Yeah, I will show you very, very quickly just how you publish the endpoint because that's uh, fairly quick to do. It will take a while to provision. But if I go into the endpoints um, and then if I want to create an endpoint, um, I select a model. So I'm going to take the dogs and our index model. Um, and then we've got various options, whether it's managed or whether I use Kubernetes, how we authenticate for it. I click on Next. Uh, it's using version two of that particular model. That's fine. And then we've got a name for the deployment, a, a timeout. We can track stuff to Application Insights if we would like to, uh, to do that. And then here, I specify the environment that I'm going to use. If I type in Annoy. And uh, that's going to be the environment that I have, uh, have built from that Docker script. And then the scoring script is going to be um, in here. If I just copy the folder path for the endpoint, copy full path, drop back here. And it's dogs score. And then uh, next, and then the actual compute, I'm going to run on one instance. I've already created quite a few endpoints here, so I don't know if it's going to give me enough uh, quota. Uh, I think I've used all of, all of my uh, all of my actual quota. But what we typically do is we select that, and then we click on Create, and it will it will create that endpoint. It also supports um, all of this kind of red blue deployment. So when we're in an endpoint, this one is taking 100% of the traffic. This deployment, so I can do another deployment, use it as a test deployment, and then flip the traffic over onto the new one. So we don't get any downtime when uh, when uh, we're replacing as well. So it provides all the support for doing deployment slots and. Uh, and uh, things like that. So check out my YouTube channel uh, for the theory on doing Spotify Annoy, and that covers the code. I'll also be uploading a, a series of videos on the Azure Machine Learning. I've got two of them recorded so far, and I'm going to be publishing them uh, on my YouTube channel uh, this uh, this month. Thanks very much for that. I will be around for questions if anybody has any uh, questions online. Does anybody have any questions now? Uh, we can do it during the break. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wish I had the webcam thing working, but I'm not smart enough to do that. So um, yeah, we, we can we can test with that if you like during the break. Yeah. Yeah.
Uh, no, auto auto ML won't work for Anoy. It will work with the um, with uh, CSV and Vision and Text, but it won't use the Anoy algorithm. You can build a components that you can plug into a pipeline that will do it in in Anoy, but you'd have to write the Python code for the component to do that. Okay, so uh, Fika is uh, is served, and uh, we'll have a, a break before the next uh, session. Thank you very much.